the 700 Club, a game changer. That's what the vicious Delta virus has become. Soaring cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are now motivating mandatory vaccinations and mask mandates indoors, even for the fully vaccinated in some states. So how are Americans responding to the Delta danger? CBN medical reporter Laurie Johnson has the latest. Monday, the Department of Veterans Affairs became the latest federal agency to require vaccination specifically for its 115,000 health care workers. The American Medical Association and 56 other leading medical organizations now calling for mandatory vaccinations for workers at all health care settings, including nursing homes nationwide. Now that is the health care industry where they are very much on the front lines. California soon requiring vaccination or negative weekly COVID tests for state and health care workers. New York City also mandating vaccination or tests for municipal workers, including teachers and health care workers, and urging private employers to require shots. It's quite clear. The Delta variant has changed the game. We need to move to stronger measures. In the meantime, Florida's governor says ordinary people should not be forced or mocked into taking the vaccine. They have different reasons for why they don't take it. And I think that the more they're hectored by government officials or some of these folks, that is not going to going to get them to yes. I can tell you that right now. Los Angeles, St. Louis, Savannah, and other areas imposing mask mandates indoors, even for the vaccinated. Right now, that goes against CDC guidance, stating only the unvaccinated should wear masks inside. But the agency may soon change that to include the vaccinated as well. It is scary, especially when the numbers are getting worse. And so I definitely do think wearing masks would be a good thing. The Delta variant, which makes up 83 percent of COVID cases in America, is much more contagious than other strains, largely because people infected with it carry up to a thousand times more virus. That means people who have no immunity are most vulnerable. In fact, health officials say 99 percent of U.S. hospitalizations and deaths are unvaccinated. I'm worried it's going to get much, much worse. Right now, we're generating about 50 50,000 Americans getting infected, that number could easily double or triple. Many Americans responding to the Delta danger. Nearly 800,000 got their shot over the weekend, a big jump over previous ones. Pat, right now about half of the total U.S. population and nearly 70 percent of all adults have been vaccinated. And health experts say in addition to getting a vaccine, a person can also achieve natural immunity if they already had the virus, Pat. Well, Larry, how long does immunity from the vaccines last? Do people will need booster shots? Well, people are already getting booster shots in Israel, uh, their third Pfizer shot. And Pfizer has asked the FDA to recommend people get third shots of their vaccine. And there are two reasons. Number one, the antibodies appear to wane after seven months. They sort of fade away after about seven months. And this is particularly concerning for people who got their shot seven months ago. Remember, those were the people who were most most at risk, the frontline health workers and nursing home residents. And another reason booster shots might be necessary is because of the Delta variant. We know, Pat, that a lot of people who are fully vaccinated are getting COVID-19 because of this Delta variant. The good news is right now it does not appear they're needing to be hospitalized and they aren't dying, but they are getting sick. They are having to stay home and miss work and suffer through COVID-19. And these are vaccinated workers because, you know, before these vaccines were great against the, the various variants that we saw, but not this Delta one. This Delta one is breaking through. Well, what's the reasoning behind reinstating mask mandates for people have already been vaccinated.
Well, again, twofold, two main reasons. And the, the main one is because these mask mandates, where if you're unvaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask indoors. But if you are vaccinated, you can go without it. This is the being done on the honor system. So, for example, I haven't worn a mask inside anywhere since the beginning of May because I was fully vaccinated. So I go into the grocery store anywhere and I'm not wearing a mask. And people just assume that I've been vaccinated, but I'm sure that there are a lot of people who just don't want to wear a mask and they haven't been vaccinated and it's kind of a free for all. And so that's kind of the reason. So if everybody's wearing a mask, we know that nobody is, you know, being dishonest about their vaccination status. And then another reason, Pat, is something that I just mentioned, and that is that even vaccinated people can get sick from COVID-19 and because the viral load is so high, can theoretically transmit it to other people. This has been studied a little bit. It needs to be studied a little bit more. But the risk is that even vaccinated can get the virus and spread it. Well, Lori, thank you for your insights. Sure. Thanks for having me. Pelosi Republicans, that's what Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are being called. They're the two Republicans Nancy Pelosi has named to the controversial committee that is investigating the attack on Capitol Hill. The first session is being held today, and Jennifer Wishon is here to tell us more about it. Here's Jennifer. Pat, the stated goal of the House Select Committee is to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th and ensure it never happens again. But before committee members ask any questions, the process is mired in controversy. Speaker Nancy Pelosi has appointed two Republicans to the 13-member panel. Liz Cheney wants the number three Republican stripped of her leadership role and Adam Kinzinger, a vocal critic of President Trump. Aren't they kind of like Pelosi Republicans? We're about very serious business here. We have uh, important work to do. Uh, and I think that's pretty childish. Pelosi's appointments come after she refused to seat two of the five members nominated by House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, Jim Jordan and Jim Banks, two staunch supporters of President Trump. So McCarthy withdrew all his picks. People said to me, put them on, and then when they act up, you can take them off. I said, why should we waste time on something as predictable? A move McCarthy says taints the committee. It shows exactly what I warned back at the beginning of January, that Pelosi would play politics with this. The panel is chaired by Democrat Congressman Benny Thompson, who, like all members, has horrific memories from that day inside America's hallowed halls. And then we get to the western side and somebody said, get on the floor. And, and they said, take your pen off. Because if they break in, they trying to kill members of Congress. Authorities say about 800 people broke through security barriers to enter the Capitol. Some 550 have been charged with crimes. Four police officers there that day will be the first to testify. I'm a big believer in sharing with the public um, what we're doing, how we're doing it. When something bad happens, um, you know, good news or bad news doesn't get any better by just, you know, sitting on it. And Monday night, the minority leader tried again to have his nominees put on the committee, but the full House voted that down. The hearings are set to get underway this morning. Pat. Uh, Jennifer, does the committee really expect to learn anything from this new investigation, or is it strictly political? That's the big question, Pat. I mean, uh, you know, we are expected to see some never-before-seen video that no members of Congress took on their, their phones that day. Uh, but, you know, law enforcement has been investigating this for seven months now. As I mentioned, some 550 people are already facing charges. Uh, a number of people who are expected to testify, including the four police officers testifying today, have testified before, so we already know what they're going to say. Um, however, Pat, it, it is possible that some unexpected information may come out of this. Remember, we all learned about then-Secretary Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's private email server during a hearing looking at the attack on the U.S. Embassy in Benghazi. So there may be some unexpected information, but in terms of new information about what happened January 6th, that is unlikely. Uh, well, uh, James Carville said the Democrats should make the Republicans, quote, own the insurrection. Now, is that, that the strategy you said could backfire on them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, look, uh, both party, both sides of the aisle are already focused on the midterm elections. And 
And Nancy Pelosi is really already playing defense because all signs indicate that she's going to lose a number of seats in the House, probably her slim majority. And so she is very uh, well aware of that. And, you know, while there are important questions about why there, uh, you know, what, what happened with the police breakdown on January 6th, you can bet that Democrats are going to focus a lot on President Trump, on Republicans here. And, you know, at some point, they're going to have to govern because guess what? President Trump and Republicans aren't in control. And while these hearings are going on, gas prices are going up, inflation is going up. And President, Bi President Biden's um, agenda that he said he wanted to pass in the first 100 days is mired in Congress. And so at a certain point, I think Democrats are going to have to stop focusing on the past, stop blaming President Trump and Republicans, and they're going to have to govern so they have something to run on in 2022. Jennifer, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we've been saying all along. It's time. You know, it's going to be law and order. There's crime all over this country breaking out. You know, what happened oh, way back on that insurrection thing? They can't keep beating that drum. You know, that st story is old now. As Jennifer says, we've got terrible inflation. We've got uh, joblessness. We've got all kinds of problems in our economy. And they can't keep focusing on Trump and the insurrection that took place a long time ago. They've got to cover in relation to law and order, in relation to the economy and uh, these other things. And they are going to lose the House. It looks like there are as many as 57 targeted Democrats in the House, and it's only going to take five, five votes to flip, and you'll get a new speaker and all that rest of it, and they're in a terrible rush to get it all done. If the United States is facing a threat from another country, the president has the power to declare war. But now President Biden is backing a measure to curtail this executive power. The bill has already passed in the House, and now Biden is supporting his passage in the Senate. The question we ask is why? If the bill passes, what sort of signal is it sent to America's en enemies? CBN White House correspondent Eric Phillips has more. The Constitution is clear. It is the job of Congress to declare war. But that hasn't happened since the 1940s. Instead, Congress has tended to approve the requests for the use of military force from the executive branch. These authorizations, though, have come without any expiration date. Now many lawmakers feel it's time to reel in some of the powers of the presidency. Just a few weeks ago, President Biden ordered these airstrikes against Iranian-backed militia groups in Syria and Iraq. The White House insisted they were necessary and in response to previous attacks on American assets. We have been very clear, the president has been very clear throughout that uh, we will act to protect U.S. personnel. It was necessary, appropriate, and deliberate uh, action, uh, these strikes uh, designed to limit the risk of escalation. It was the second airstrike ordered unilaterally by President Biden with the White House defending both actions as lawful. Article 2, the self-defense, the defense of the United States and our interests uh, is our domestic justification for these strikes. Orders came as lawmakers had already begun working to repeal the two decade old authorizations for the use of military force in Iraq. They also allowed the president latitude to order strikes like these recent ones. These authorizations tend to be broad and have, in effect, shifted some war powers to the presidency. They're often um, phrased not just as the United States is at war with country X, but uh, here's a threat that the United States is facing, and the president is authorized to use, let's say, all necessary and appropriate force or some such language in order to eradicate that threat. This executive order I'm signing. Some in Biden's own party are sounding the alarm about possible abuses of the authorizations, which presidents from both parties have used to legally justify various military operations while also circumventing Congress. The House already passed a measure to curtail this executive power. Biden appears supportive of one passing the Senate as well. I try to be as persuasive as I can. The president has talked about his desire to uh, update um, and work with Congress, Senator Kane and others, uh, to update authorization parameters and legislation. 
Senate will come to order. Where you stand depends on where you sit. Michael O'Hanlon is a senior fellow with the Brookings Institution. My view on Biden's Senate record is that he generally wanted Congress to be more involved. But my view of his eight years as vice president is that the Obama administration didn't do that much to get Congress more involved, even though both he and Barack Obama had been senators. That's why O'Hanlon is not convinced that, as president, Biden's push to alter war powers will be wholehearted or sustained. Once you're in that White House, you tend to like your own flexibility, and you tend to prefer the fewest restrictions possible. O'Hanlon adds revising these war powers could prove to be more complicated than expected. That's because after 9-11, Congress authorized the pursuit of al-Qaeda and anyone associated with the attack. It also allowed President Bush to use U.S. might to make sure Saddam Hussein did not have any nuclear weapons. Plus, there's the War Powers Act of the 1970s, which requires the president to obtain approval from Congress within 60 days of initiating a military operation. You put all this together and you got a bit of a mess. And uh, Joe Biden, I think, is going to have to ask himself, is he content to just try to filibuster, so to speak, the, the Senate and the House on this issue and stick with the powers he has now, which from a president's point of view aren't so bad because they give him a lot of leeway? Or does he agree that, especially in a world where um, Donald Trump may be president again, someone like Donald Trump may be president again, it's better to make sure that there is strict oversight, checks and balances, and a return more to what the founding fathers arguably wanted. O'Hanlon adds any revisions or limits would have to be done carefully because of the world in which we live. If you limit the geographic scope of your authorization on the use of military force, then you perhaps give a future terrorist group or someone else sort of carte blanche to do bad things outside of that zone. Some lawmakers argue change is needed because the ongoing involvement of American troops in the Middle East over the last 20 years looks and feels like a low-scale war, one that was never approved by Congress. In Washington, Eric Phillips, CBN News. Thanks, Eric. You know, my feeling is to limit the president's power in these things is a mistake. But there was a group that started out in, in the House uh, when Biden first took over that wanted to limit his power to uh, throw the nuclear weapon at somebody. And he wanted to restrict it, he, that he couldn't do it without the consent of Congress under any circumstances. That was a good move. The other one probably is a mistake. Terry? The game of life has a running clock. There's no timeout and certainly no button to rewind. So what do you do if life doesn't go the way you planned? Take a look. Jonathan Evans is an author, pastor, former NFL player, and chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys. Growing up as the son of well-known pastor Tony Evans, Jonathan was riding on cruise control until he realized that he didn't know his purpose in life. In his book, Your Time Is Now, Jonathan shares his personal story of finding his calling, and he wants to help you do the same. Jonathan Evans joins us now via Skype. Jonathan, great to have you with us today. You had... A you had a dream for your life. You wanted to run out of that tunnel in an NFL game, have a wonderful career, and then a slew of injuries brought a premature end to that dream. How did you handle the feeling of, what am I going to do now when you hadn't planned for anything else? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, like you said, I had that dream, and to, all I wanted to do was run out of the tunnel and play in the NFL. And in uh, five years, I was on five or six teams from everything from hurt, carted off the field, traded. I mean, anything bad that could happen, happened. And then, uh, you know, my wife said, I think it's time to move on. And I finally got a call from the Kansas City Chiefs uh, to come back and play. And I looked at my wife and I said, see, God still wants me to play in the NFL. And um, as I was working out to go to the Kansas City Chiefs, I tore my Achilles. Oh. And that was the final, the final blow. Uh, so I ended up limping in the seminary. The place I was running from is what I limped into. It's like Jacob. When you wrestle with God, he'll change how you walk. And so I, I limped in the seminary. And while I was there, I got a call to come back and be the chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys. And it was, that, it was as if God was saying, I take your greatest misery and turn it into your greatest ministry. Yeah. And 
that's just the way it worked out. At one point in your life, you wanted nothing to do with the pulpit. So, you know, what happened in that interim that you were willing to limp into <laughs> having a, a completely different career? Well, you know, you know, your dad being Tony Evans, you know, you try, you, you try as hard as you can as a son to stay away from that because it's almost like Michael Jordan's son trying to try out for the Bulls itself. I mean, it just kind of doesn't work. Uh, because you're always going to be compared to one of the greatest of all time, and uh, you know, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to do that. Uh, but God would would use that fear and that doubt, and He would take me into scenarios where I was still kind of having to do it, almost as if He was preparing me. And once I went into seminary, it's almost like I just got thrown in there, and uh, I realized that it was a gift. I realized it was a passion. I realized the opportunity was given and the experiences were had. And once those four things come together, you've run into purpose. Jonathan, I loved your book. The title is Your Time Is Now. You talk a lot in the book about uh, the story of Joshua from the Bible. What can we learn from him? Well, yeah, when he experienced a great loss in Deuteronomy 34, before you turn the page to Joshua 1, Moses died. I mean, and it says now, um, after the death of Moses, uh, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua. And so uh, one thing that Joshua had to do is realize that even through his pain and his mourning, uh, God would call him to a monumental calling. And he would have to stay, he would have to move forward uh, because if he stayed with Moses, he would be stuck on the wrong side of his calling. And there's some things in our lives um, that we don't want to put down because they've been so good for us for so long. Yeah. And as long as hold on to him, we'll still be stuck on the wrong side of the column because God said that Moses cannot go. And so people have to think about what about themselves or what about their friends or what about the things that they have in their life? Are they unwilling to put down? But they may be, uh, that may be the thing that's holding them on the wrong side of the Jordan of their calling. And for me, it was fear. For me, it was doubt. Uh, for me, it was uh, comfortability and just being an athlete and not trying to move. I didn't want to put it down. And God was saying, until you put this down, you will not run out of the tunnel which is your dream. And I've been running out of the tunnel for 10 years. So God always wanted it, but he always wanted it his way, not my way. So I had to put it down. Well, there's a level of surrender in that that every Christian has to go to through. How can a person know if they're on the path that God wants them to be on? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great question is knowing that you're on God's path and not just your path. You know, a lot of people think God's voice is that voice they hear in their head that tells them what they already want to do anyway. And the reality is, no, that's your voice. That's why it sounds like you. Um, and so you know that it's God's voice because God, as high as the heavens are above the earth, are his ways from your ways and his thoughts from your thoughts. God's voice is that voice that's taking you into the uncomfortable place consistently or the illogical place that you're always trying to justify out of, but you just can't. You're trying to justify it. You're trying to say, well, that doesn't make sense. And you're trying to say, well, what's the point of that? but you can't get rid of it. It's just a constant thing that stays on you. And that's when you know God is trying to push you. It's just like Genesis 12, the word of the Lord came to Abraham and said, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house. In other words, the word of the Lord came to Abraham to push him out of everything that he was comfortable with. And a lot of times people don't want to put down their comfort in pursuit of their calling. And God's voice will always pull you out of your comfort because he's not focused on the comfort. He's focused on the calling and the advancement of his kingdom. And so really, it's just about putting down that comfortability and moving forward to what God wants you to do. You know, sometimes that pulling of God is also uh, in our lives, a letting go of things that, that, that we care about, people that we care about. Uh, you lost your mom recently. You've lost a number of other family members. When your mom knew she wasn't going to live, she sat down and talked with you guys, and she had a very uh, direct and meaningful conversation. What did she tell you? Yeah, she said, I mean, we cried the, the moment that we found out that my dad said it's terminal and there's nothing any doctor can do. It was just a waiting game. And I just remember my mom saying, are you guys finished yet? <laughs> As we were crying, and I said, I guess so. I mean, uh, and so she said, sit down. And she said, you know, this is spiritual warfare. We've lost you know, like, I don't know, five to seven members of our family in a span of a year and a half. And now this is happening. And she said, it's spiritual warfare. And one thing the Evans family will not do is tuck tail and run uh, when the enemy is, is, is trying to use this for his work and to take us out as a family in the ministry that we're called to. 
And so she just said, if you're called to preach, you're going to preach. If you're called to sing, you're going to sing. If you're called to, to disciple and, and write a Bible study, that's what you're going to do because it's about the advancement of his kingdom. And my response was, my response was, um, how in the world can you be talking about ministry at a time like this? And that's when she said to me, she said, Jonathan, because that's the reason why you exist. And you never let that go. You never um, um, forget. You never let these threats make you forget what you've been called to do. You use them as a catalyst uh, for what you've been called to do. And so she pushed us forward and she said, this is what we're going to do. I know you're going to take care of me, but at the end of the day, you got to take care of your responsibility that God has given you. And that's exactly what you're going to do. And I won't accept anything less. That's, so. that's what the book is all about. Your time is now. How do we do that? How do we push through? How do we grab hold of God's purpose? How do we make a difference and follow the calling that's intended for our lives? The book is called Your Time is Now. It's available in stores nationwide. Jonathan, wonderful to talk to you today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Sandra's body was failing, so doctors told her family to say their final goodbyes. As Sandra's life was slipping away, her husband sent a text message. What did it say? And how did that message save Sandra's life? Take a look. Seeing someone you love so much just becomes sick so quick. And knowing that Every decision I make in this point is pretty critical um, to the point of like, do I call 911? Sandra and Roger Bredding have been happily married for over 30 years and have two daughters. One night while Roger was on a business trip, Sandra became very ill. Their daughter Dana was 17 at the time. I woke up in the middle of the night and I just heard screaming. She's just like, something's wrong, something's wrong. Like, started throwing up a bunch. But she's like, I think I need to go to the ER. Dana braved the icy roads and drove her mom to the ER while her dad found a flight home. Sandra had a blockage from a kidney stone causing a severe infection. The doctors planned to insert a stent to drain the infection. As soon as I went in and placed the tube and got beyond the point of blockage, there was a lot of pus and a lot of debris and it looked cloudy, it looked dark and it looked like this had been going on for a few days and was just at the tipping point. I'm praying that the doctors are going to find a solution here. They've told me that she has sepsis, and they're looking for the correct bacterial infection and to get her the right antibiotic, but she continues to deteriorate. After surgery, Sandra was moved to the ICU and developed ARDS deadly type of respiratory failure that makes it difficult to ventilate a patient. I know what ARDS was. My best friend died of it at the age of 27 many years ago. I'm sitting there thinking, this is bad news. This is, this is about as bad as it can get. She's on medicines to basically keep her in a coma, to keep her relaxed, have the breathing machines, helping her breathe. At one point, the intensive care unit team thought she wasn't gonna make it and actually had her husband notify the family members that if they wanted to come and spend the last few minutes with her. I've got to go out and make a phone call to my 17-year-old daughter who is staying at the house, and then I've got to wake up my other daughter in Dallas. It's 4.30 in the morning and said, listen, you got you got to come. you got to come see your mother. And uh, tough spot. I knew things are very serious we as a family might be preparing to say goodbye. Like no medicine's gonna be able to heal this unless the Lord answers his prayer. And ultimately knowing that his will is gonna be done and either way his will is perfect. And I was gonna have to be obedient to that. Probably the toughest part, besides watching your, your wife die of 30 years, is watching your 17 year old daughter who's got her whole life ahead of her, watching her mother die. This is hard. And it hurts me to say this prayer, but I'm going to pray. One, I would love for you to heal my mom. <laughs> uh, would like love every result to start coming back positive, Lord. But would love more for you to give me the obedience to trust in you. I was bottomed out, total bottom. No, I did not have a lot of hope. And that's, that's when I sent the text. After I called my daughters, I, I sent a text to a buddy and um, 
said, listen, you know, if you guys were ever going to pray, pray now. Sandy's not doing well. She's not going to make it. I mean, immediately, I knew that people were praying so hard because they dropped everything to come to our side. People left work. People left every responsibility they had to just come and be with us. You know, it turns out thousands of people had prayed. People would show up in the waiting room of intensive care, and uh, the support was, was amazing. Every time I went into or out of the ICU, I was just, like, enveloped of, like, a team of 30 people. I like to call it home team because it really was a home team just fighting. There was one day where we saw a, a little bit of hope, and we felt like, all right, this is where there's some air, then the treatment is working, her lungs are starting to open up, and it was like a ray of hope at this really dark and challenging time for the family. Sandra started a dramatic recovery, and after 10 days in the hospital, was cleared to go home. I remember in the waiting area, it was like a small church. I think one day there were like, I think, 50 or 40 people there, and I was just blown away. Because honestly, without the prayers and without the whole team helping her, I don't think she could have made it. And honestly, I've seen cases where everything is done right and patients still don't make it. So a case like this that was really advanced and where she was able to pull through, I think you could say it was a miracle. I learned so much about prayer, one of which was, you know, to go to God first. Don't go to God last because as our Father, He wants to hear from us all the way through, not just when there's a trauma, not just when we're at the critical point, but if we have that relationship with Him, it's so much easier us to fall back on that relationship and say, okay, I'm in God's hands now. I'm so thankful that the Lord listens to our prayers. And I'm so thankful that I got to witness and answer to prayer. I think it's increased my faith even more because every morning now when I get up, I make it a point to say, thank you, God, for one more day. And um, I think about all the things in the future that I'll get to see that I wouldn't have gotten to see otherwise, and such a gift. So yeah, God has really blessed me. And again, I don't know why He blessed me and, and not others in that way, but um, I'm just thankful He did. Prayer works. You know, for any survivor of any kind of, you know, medical trauma, you know, prayer works. God does perform miracles. I think that's a very profound statement. God does perform miracles. Here's some of them. Charlotte sent us an email, and she said, I was watching the 700 Club, and a word of knowledge is someone had a systolic heart murmur. I felt a burning in my chest. I immediately claimed that healing, and I prayed the healing would include my heart failure, and I had a, a, a electro, a echocardiogram. Miraculous. My labs were perfect. No heart failure. I thank God for giving me a new heart. That's amazing. This is a different Sandra than the one in the story we just saw. She writes, the other day, Pat prophesied that someone's toe was being healed. It was an issue that was affecting their whole body. Well, it was me. I broke my toe three times in one week about two years ago. This toe has caused problems with the way I walk, which was affecting many areas of my body. For two days now, the pain is gone. I'm walking fine. I knew as he was saying it that I was the one that would receive this healing. Thank you, Jesus. All right, folks. God is a God who loves you. And Jesus said, Hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive, yeah. that your joy might be full. God wants us to be filled with joy, and he wants to answer our prayers. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands. We're going to believe God for you. Mm. I ask you to pray with us. Jesus. Don't fight it. Just receive what God's doing. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, and we pray for miracles. We thank you. You are the God who created us. You made us. You put it together when we were yet in our mother's womb. You formed us, and you made us your people. There's a severe lung infection. Uh, there's a pulmonary thing that we've heard about already, but right now put your hand in your chest. Touch them. In the name of Jesus, you are healed, and somebody has there's, there's something wrong. You, you have, I think it's testicular cancer, and God has just touched you. I mean, the, the name Bobby comes to me right now. Touch him. 
Terry. Now, there's someone else. You have an issue with lactic acid in your body, and God is healing that condition for you right now. All of the, the things that result from that, you'll not experience anymore. And then also some uh, something with the, your nails, both fingernails and toenails, with just like a disintegration of them. God's healing that condition. Thank just you, Lord. to praise Him. And Father, for this nation, we, we pray once again, this chaos and hatred and bitterness throughout this world, May the peace of God that passes understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In His name we ask it. Amen. 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 Give us a call, please. We'd love to hear from you. If you need further prayer, we've got phones at the people at the phone for 1-800-700-7000. Just go to your phone and say, hey, pray for me. And people will be delighted to hear the good news that you've been touched. Whatever it is, we're here for you. Raisa is a widow living in Israel. When her husband died, she was left with two children, no job, and bills piling up. So where did she turn for help? Just watch. When Raisa fell in love with an Israeli, she got married, immigrated from Russia to Israel, and started a family. She was heartbroken and overwhelmed when her husband suddenly passed away, leaving her and two young children with no income. I tried to keep life as normal as possible for my children. But inside, I was terrified. My husband handled all of the finances, and I didn't know we had a large debt at the bank. Childcare is so expensive in Israel, Raisa couldn't afford to work a regular day job. To top it off, rent was past due on their apartment. I had no money, and the landlord threatened to evict us. Raisa prayed and asked God for help. Then a friend put her in contact with CBN Israel. First, we paid two months of Raisa's rent so she wouldn't lose her apartment. Then, we renegotiated her debt down to one-third what it originally was and paid the reduced amount off in full. We also made sure the family had food to eat. This help is tremendous, and it gave me a chance to catch my breath and figure out how to move forward. Raisa found a good job in a clothing store. Flexible hours allow her to cover her expenses and still spend time with her kids. Thanks to CBN donors, Raisa found the support she needed during a difficult time, and now she can take care of her family. You brought me spiritual joy and let me know that there are good people in the world. You made me feel that I'm not alone. I can't say enough how grateful my family is to you. Put yourself in this young woman's situation. I mean, here she is. Her husband dies unexpectedly. He had handled all of the finances. She's got two children, no job, finds out she has a large debt. You know, she said in there, once help came, she was able to breathe a little bit, to sit back and look at her situation and say, what next? Just want to thank you, 700 Club members. If I had to summarize what you bring into people's lives, it's hope. It's hope, and you can't put a price tag on that. Listen, this kind of work, this kind of outreach is being done on so many different levels all around the world, as well as right here at home in the United States. If you're not a 700 Club member, you want to be a part of this. You're changing people's lives when you reach out in this way. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. Can we count on you? Will you go to your phone now and call? Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Uh, here's someone who has joined, and they're excited about the gift we've sent them. This is Betty. She's from Keokuk, Keokuk, Iowa. Is Keokuk. that right? Keokuk. Okay. Well, Betty has received our thank you. She's just joined, and it's God is for us. Pat's reading all wonderful scriptures, verses of salvation, peace, and victory from the book of Romans. This is what Betty says. God is for us was very insightful, a good learning experience. I understand the book of Romans better and enjoy listening to God is for us. We want to bless you as you bless others, so call and join the 700 Club, and we will send you God is for us. Well, our viewers have sent in their questions. Pat, are you ready? Uh, I'll let you know after I hear the okay. This is Emily who says, I divorced my husband four months ago. We've reconciled, but we've been told that we can't remarry, that biblically you can't remarry once you've been apart through a divorce. Is this true? Also, we live together in the same house. Is that okay if we don't have any sex and just live as roommates? Uh, there is a word in the Old Testament 
that has to do with a wife being shamed, and if you go back and take her again, uh, it's not proper. Look, that's Old Testament. There's absolutely no prohibition whatsoever for, for a Christian to remarry the spouse that they've divorced. None whatsoever. So by all means, get married and enjoy a happy life together. That, that's Old Testament, and you're not bound by that at all, okay? This is Penny who says, Hi, Pat, I've had so much trouble with my joints lately. Every time I exercise, I find myself in so much pain the next day and the day after that. What supplements or foods are best to keep my joints working? Um, I have found, uh, uh, you know, the uh, ointment that you can use is the 1,000 milligrams of the, uh, uh, it's actually a derivative of marijuana that they use. The uh, CBD uh, DVD, and, and, and uh, it's excellent to rub on. And, but there are other things, as capsaicin and so forth, that you can put on yourself. I, I, I just uh, take, uh, about before I start working, I take about three Tylenol. <laughs> <laughs> three, and, and it seems to, to work very well. But um, I also find those statins, I don't know if you're taking them, but they will cause joint pain and, and suffering. And I don't know if you're taking them or not. But uh, the, the, other than that, I think that uh, um, I'm trying to think the name of the company that uh, is it's like Nutera, and they have a 1,000 milligram uh, of, of the uh, cream you're talking about. Cream you rub on yourself. But um, I think that'll take care of it, hopefully. Right. This is Elizabeth who says, Hi, Pat. Would I be out of God's will to sue my son's dad? He hid from child support until my son was an adult. He doesn't want to give him anything. He sold the inheritance that was given to him by his grandmother, but she died before she put the papers into play. He thinks he got away with it. Should I sue, or would that be out of God's will? Uh, you know, it's a question of your attitude. The courts are set up, the civil law is set up so that they can be redressed in the courts. And uh, all the way through the Bible, there have been courts that people come to. And uh, this man apparently is, is stealing and he's cheating. And I don't think there's any reason. The question is, what's in your heart? If you have resentment in your heart and you're trying to stick it to him, then I would hesitate. But if you if you keep an open mind and if you're not bitter against him, I, I don't see anything wrong with asking for for a re reasonable redress to somebody who is what you'd call a scofflaw. Okay. This is George who says, Pat, I think Biden's trying to tank the dollar for the Chinese yen. What do you think? Oh, I think that's too complicated. I don't I don't think Biden is, is thinks that way. I, I really don't. <laughs> I think to to tank the dollar for the yen. No, no. I think he's running inflationary uh, economy that's going to tank it anyhow. And all this, this added debt is unbelievable. The trillions of dollars they want to spend, that's going to tank the dollar. But I don't think he has, he has two steps down the road thinking, well, I'm going to do it in favor of the yen. All right. This is Michael who says, my wife and I pay tithes every month and give money to our family in the Philippines, plus other giving. I just don't see the windows of heaven opening up. So where is God in all of this? Sometimes I feel I'm cursed. Please explain this to well, me. The Bible says, prove me. The one thing that we, we're supposed to prove the Lord with tithes and offerings, if I won't open the windows of heaven. So when you give unto the Lord, give with expectations. I'm sending this out and I am believing God for an answer. Don't just give it, and certainly don't give it resentfully. God loves a, a, a joyful giver. But give as unto the Lord and expect that money that's going to go out will come back just like the Lord. The Lord will not break his promises. He must do what he said he'll do. And he said, prove me, prove me, test me with your tithes and offerings. If I want to open the windows of heaven and pour you as such a blessing, you can't contain it. So God's got to do what he says. So there's something in your heart. You've got to be expecting it. Okay. All right. This is Holly who says, what does it mean to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? We shall not all sleep, but the dead in Christ shall arise first. So when you die, are you asleep until the rapture if you die in Christ? Uh, no, you're not. Uh, 
what, what Paul says, we should all sleep with, you know, when at the last trump, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up to be with him in the, in the air. Uh, in the meantime, our spirit is in paradise, and the, the uh, body uh, will, will not be resurrected until the, the coming of the Lord, but those who die first will not be left behind. The idea is, you know, the, the, I think that's what we're talking about, aren't right? This is Linda who says, Dear Pat, is the book of Revelation relevant to Christians today, or was it primarily written for believers in the time of John who authored it? Many people say that it explains prophecies in the Gospels, but I find it confusing and difficult to comprehend. Please help. When I was in seminary, I wrote a, a whole chart of Revelation. I got an A on it. And I tell you, I've taught Revelation. I still don't understand it. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I mean, the first few chapters are pretty solid to the churches. They, they, they give good advice. But a lot of it is, is uh, uh, in apocalyptic terms, and a lot of it was intended for the church who were under persecution. There were 10 distinct persecutions against the Christians under Rome, and I think part of the Re book of Revelation was to, to bless them and encourage them. Mm -hmm. We leave you with this word from 1 Corinthians. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.